we already mentioned a little bit about forgetting. Um, so a lot of forgetting is um, that retrieval failure where we don't get information back out of our storage. But we can also have some encoding failure as well. Um, if you're not paying attention to something, if it doesn't enter your sh uh, short-term memory to begin with, then it's probably not going to get put into your long-term memory either. So if you're not paying attention, it's not going to get encoded. Um, and there are other things where if you don't process it deeply enough, you might not remember it. So you might be able to remember what it was like to sit in our classroom back on campus, but maybe you don't remember what everybody in the class looked like because those weren't necessarily important details. So you're only encoding the big important stuff like what did the room look like, but you're going to focus less on the tiny little details like uh, how many rows of desks are there. Um, that's something that's a little bit harder and you didn't necessarily put a lot of processing power into storing that information. Um, we can also have issues like the decay of memory trace. So this is where we get that retrieval problem. So, um, so in order to go and get something that has been stored away, you kind of have to follow a pathway through the neurons in your brain to where that memory is stored. And that's called a memory trace. Um, so the long-term physical trace in your nervous system, the pathway to get to that memory, fades away over time and it fades with disuse. So if you don't use or access a memory fairly often, you can lose your way to access that memory. And we can use specific cues to help you think back to that particular memory, but um, your, your pathway gets uh, less clear over time and we can lose those memories over time. Um, I like thinking about if you've ever seen the movie, um, The movie Inside Out, completely forgot the name, which is appropriate considering we're talking about forgetting. Um, but Inside Out has their vaults of memories all stored in glass orbs. Um, and so you have to know where each one is on its shelf to go and get it to look at it. Um, it's kind of a neat way to think about memories all being stored in particular places that you have to remember to get to. Um, when we're talking about forgetting, so if if it's not something that was never stored to begin with, or if we haven't lost our way of getting there, there can be other problems that interfere with us accessing a memory. And so these are our interference theories. And the idea here is that information is forgotten because other items in your long-term memory are going to impair or mess with your ability to retrieve it. So you learn other things that now mess with the ability to recall other things you've learned. Um, and there's two forms that we can talk about. The first is proactive interference. And this is the idea that past material interferes with the recall of newer material. Um, and so if we hop to the next slide, we're gonna talk about those ambitious people that learn two languages. I have enough trouble with one. Thank you very much. But um, if you're trying to learn both Spanish and French, if you learned Spanish originally, maybe you learned it as a child, maybe that's what you were taught in school, and now in university you're learning French, by our proactive interference theory, we're saying that what you already knew of Spanish is interfering with your ability to remember your new French words. So the early stuff, is interfering with the newer, uh, more recent stuff. Um, so the idea that if you're trying to think of the French word for house, um, and all you can think of is the Spanish uh, casa, I think. Um, and for the life of you, you cannot remember the word maison. Um, and that's because the Spanish is doing the interfering. For retroactive interference, we're saying that our new information interferes with ability to recall older information. So we have the same setup. You learned Spanish as a child, and now you're learning French in university. 
in retroactive interference, we're saying that um, French, the thing that you're learning right now, is interfering with the recall of Spanish words. So all you can think of is the new French words that you've just learned, and they're overriding or messing with your Spanish words. Um, so uh, proactive is this one's causing problems with this, and retroactive is this one is causing problems with that. Um, so it's just the directionality of that interference. Um, and both can be happening. We're not saying that one theory is correct and the other is not. Um, both can exist and start causing problems. Um, we're just going to call it proactive or retroactive, depending on the direction of that interference. Um, and we can't talk about forgetting without uh, bringing back up our amnesia topics. We already covered this when we were talking about our case studies, though, so we won't spend much time here. But we can have our enterograde amnesia, where you lose the ability to assimilate and retain new knowledge. So everything after a damaging event, um, you can't form new memories. Or you can have retrograde amnesia, which is the loss of memory for events that happened in the past. So everything before a brain injury is lost. Um, so those are our two distinctive types of amnesia. We can also talk about another sort of weird case of amnesia, and this is infantile or childhood amnesia. And this is something that pretty much everyone experiences. And this is the inability to remember childhood experiences, basically everything that happened before the age of three or four, um, once you become an adult. So if you were asked what you did for your second birthday, most of us have absolutely no idea. We have no clear memory of what happened when we were very young. And that's consistent for almost everybody on the planet. Um, the reason why is one of those question mark causes where we're not quite sure what's going on. But people feel that maybe the areas of our brain involved in encoding information when we're that young hadn't yet matured. So we couldn't really store long-term memories at that point, um, so we don't have any memories to retrieve. Um, or perhaps there was a limited depth of encoding, maybe we weren't processing or uh, dealing with that information at the right level for it to be encoded and stored for a long time. Um, we're not quite sure, but it is an interesting universal experience. Um, we can also run into forgetting in the forms of dementia. So, and that's going to be impaired memory plus some other cognitive deficits that seem to accompany brain degeneration um, and they interfere with normal functioning. And one of the closest related topics to dementia, one of the sources of it is going to be Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease can cause severe retrograde and enterograde amnesia because it's interfering with our brain functioning. It's causing degeneration and has lots of side effects because of that. Um, and just a quick look here on how uh, Alzheimer's disease tends to progress. It seems to spread from our temporal lobes into the frontal lobes and other cortical regions. So it sort of starts in the middle of our brains and then spreads outward. So before it's diagnosed, it's kept very central here to the temporal lobes, and then it's going to spread forward to our frontal lobes and then backward as well. And by the time it's progressed to severe cases, it's spread throughout most of the brain. Um, and symptoms aren't just uh, amnesia, though forgetfulness is a, um, a side effect. It also comes along with poor judgment, so those cognitive impairments, some confusion and disorientation. So if you're having trouble remembering things or knowing where you are, that makes sense. Um, and it's going to spread throughout the brain. There's lots and lots more uh, that we could talk about with Alzheimer's disease, but again, we don't have tons of time, um, so we can leave that for another class. Um, another type of forgetting that we commonly see is the forgetting to do something. And so this is called prospective memory. The idea of remembering, 
remembering to perform a task in the future. So uh, you go to bed one night and you say, oh, when I wake up, I have to remember to uh, do a load of laundry. And then you wake up the next morning, you go about your day, and then going to bed the next night, you go, oh no, I was supposed to have done laundry. Um, that's your prospective memory not doing its job. Um, but to have a properly front functioning prospective memory, it's going to involve planning and attention. Planning because you're going to do a task in the future, and attention because you have to bring that back into your attention to do the task at that future time. Um, and this seems to be involved, our, our frontal lobes seem to be involved in pointing our executive processes towards these tasks to be able to remember to do something and then do it. Um, and interestingly, people who have good memory, just um, normal recall from long-term storage, people who are good at remembering things that have happened in the past, aren't necessarily any better at this prospective memory. So they can remember things that have happened in the past, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're good at remembering to do things in the future. So it seems to be a different system, but we're not really sure which one it is. Um, as we get into the more complicated stuff, we figure out more and more that the human brain is just a mystery on so many levels. Um, and this perspective memory seems to decline with age. So as you get older, it gets harder and harder to remember to do something in the future which does not bode well for someone like me who's had a terrible memory, has had a terrible memory since the beginning. Um, but again, besides the point. All right, so another thing that we can have is motivated forgetting, potentially. And this is the idea of repression, where you are repressing or blocking out a recall of anxiety arousing memories. And so for some of you, this should start raising some Freud type flags in our brains. And that's exactly what's going on. A lot of repression stuff is based on Freud and his concepts and ideas. Um, so they're not quite sure if it's a conscious or unconscious process, because sometimes people seem to want not to remember traumatic events, but other times they don't necessarily want to lose a memory and they end up losing it anyways. Um, so repression is another one of those weird gray areas where we're not quite sure what's going on, but there are a lot of people who've had some really traumatic experiences and they seem to repress those memories. And again, we're not sure if it's intentional or unintentional, but it seems to happen fairly consistently. So this is a process that happens that we really don't understand very well, at least not at this point in time. 